Good morning, brothers and sister. Oh, now sisters, plural. <laughs> okay. Uh, I'm happy to be back again for the second sharing of my material. Um, so today's topic is Loba Dosa Moha. And this is again a presentation from a scientific perspective. Basically, it is covering how our brain evolved with natural instincts that drive our natural behavior. Right? Because we have certain instincts. Right? So how the brain has evolved, giving rise to these evolutionary instincts and our emotions, which drive our natural behavior. One very important point, which it is not totally proven, but it is believed uh, by many scientists that emotions is something that has evolved. And in fact, this is consistent with the teachings of the Buddha, that our original nature is pure, free of emotional reactions. So the fact that uh, we react emotionally, that emotional reaction is an evolved condition, an evolved response, right? And these are caused by evolutionary instincts. I'll talk a little bit about evolutionary instincts. And it is these instincts which drive our natural behavior. That means when we behave without thinking clearly, then naturally we behave in a very emotional manner. And there is a very strong scientific basis for that. Emotional reactions to sensual stimulus lead to unwholesome roots of conditioning. And these unwholesome roots of conditioning are called loba, dosa, and moha. Unwholesome roots of conditioning is actually called akusala mula. Okay. I will explain that later on. And then we're going to look at how we can overcome all these, how we can transcend these evolutionary instincts and unwholesome roots of conditioning to cultivate wholesome human nature. See, the unwholesome roots of conditioning is, a, is actually the result of life after life of conditioning. Generation after generation of conditioning. There are two streams. One stream is biological. Biological meaning from our genes, genetic inheritance. The behavior of our parent, right, constantly in a certain manner, get programmed into their genes and it's passed on to us from our ancestors. That is the biological stream. And there is also another stream which is the result of our rebirth. Life after life, we've been conditioned in a certain way. And this conditioning continues, life after life. So we behave in a certain way because of this conditioning. Today we are really just going to look at the biological conditioning because I'm, I'm covering a scientific perspective. So I will not be talking about the other one which is coming from rebirth. I'm only talking about the one that is coming from the biological basis, our genetic inheritance on this conditioning. We covered already this question, who am I? And we already know that when we speak of who am I, then we can only say we are organisms in an environment given two conditions which are beyond our control, metabolism that keeps us alive, Consciousness that helps us interact with the environment and the environment being very complex. To a great degree, these are also common amongst all animals. Metabolism is common amongst all animals. Consciousness is common only at different levels. If you speak of low-level animals like fish and insects, they will not have Consciousness according to the way science defines consciousness. Consciousness as defined by science is the ability to 
to experience, understand the experience, think and respond to that experience. And in that process, we then have a notion of a self. Now this consciousness and notion of a self is predominantly in human beings. But now scientists are beginning to find that some animals appear to carry some kind of a sense of, of a self in that sense. But we're not going to go into that. We're just going to talk about the human beings, basically. So today we're going to cover deeper into this and look at how our roots of conditioning help or help to, to govern the way we behave, behave. We spoke about this before, that the brain has evolved into three distinct layers. The most ancient is the brain stem, the survival brain that keeps us alive, and so on. So today I'm going to explain a bit deeper, so you have a slight further understanding, because there is something in there very important we have to realize, which is the biochemical basis of emotional reaction. We're going to talk about that a bit more today. So the brain having evolved into these three layers, the most ancient or oldest layer is the brain stem. It is called the survival brain. This is the most primitive part formed at the top of the spinal cord. What does it do? It governs autonomic physiological functions. These are the involuntary functions such as heart rate, respiration, digestion, blood pressure, and so on. These are absolutely necessary to keep us alive. These are all consistent with the whole process of metabolism. They are supporting the process of metabolism. Because in order for metabolism to take place, it needs to absorb energy from the environment. And the brain stem is made of various systems to help supply energy throughout the body through oxygen circulated in the blood, nutrients, and so on. These are all happening involuntarily. The next part of the brain that evolves subsequently is the limbic system. This is commonly called the emotional brain or the emotional center of our brain. This is the middle layer and this basically coordinates all sensory reception. That means when we sense something, it all, all the signals are brought into this part of the brain. And it is this part of the brain that distributes these sense signals, sense, sensations for the thinking brain to process. The thinking brain is the later evolved brain. This is why humans are able to think because we have all the thinking brain that comes later. But in this emotional brain, there is also memory and the management of memory. And it also governs emotional arousal and unconscious emotional reactions. All emotional reactions are unconscious. Unconscious in the sense that when our emotions are aroused, we are not aware of the arousal. After emotions have been aroused, biochemical reactions take place in the body. And then we begin to feel this bodily sensation. That is the only time when we become aware of our emotions. Uh, we spoke about that briefly. We're going to talk about that a little bit more today. Then comes the third part of the brain that has evolved. The learning brain. Some call it the thinking brain. This is the cerebral cortex. This is made of six layers, the outermost layers, all compressed together. This is the newest part of the brain that has evolved, and it processes perceptual awareness. That means all the, all the sensations that come into the brain is distributed to this part of the brain for processing. It also processes our attention system. When we pay attention, it is because this part of the brain is very highly active. It also contains various systems and functions that help us thrive in our environment, such as language, logic, reasoning, learning, and decision-making. 
This is basically our thinking and learning center. So the brain is made of these three parts. The survival brain, the emotional brain, and the learning brain. We're going to concentrate a little bit more on this emotional brain because it is this emotional brain that gives rise to a lot of our reactions and gives rise to a lot of the suffering that we experience. And as we, we've spoken before, buried deep inside this emotional brain is a little structure called amygdala. And this amygdala senses incoming sensations and, and determine whether they are threat. If they are threat, it triggers fight or flight reaction to help protect us, protect the organisms from harm. But sometimes the amygdala can be unnecessarily aroused or basically certain sensations can arouse the amygdala. And when the amygdala is aroused, it causes us to feel the stress. It causes us to feel various bodily sensations. And this bodily sensation leads us to behave in certain ways. And we're going to talk about that today. First, let's take a look at how this brain has evolved. It is called the triuni brain. Tri meaning triple, three layers. Uni means the three layers work as one. So triuni brain. That's what they call it. As humans have evolved, it's doubled in size. It weighs only three pounds, but it consumes 20% of all the fuel our bodies take in, generating enough energy to keep a light bulb burning. And you have to consider the brain having evolved like an old house, where we just added different rooms. And so there's all these stairways and connections. In the basement is the oldest part, called the brain stem. It's something we share with reptiles and other mammals. It's what keeps us alive governing vital functions like heart rate, respiration, digestion, and blood pressure. Things that happen without having to think about them. The next level up, the first floor, more evolved. Hundreds of thousands of years later, it's called the limbic system. And this is very important in the processing of emotions. Within the limbic system are the amygdala, two nuggets of tissue, one in each half of the brain. They are no bigger than a fingernail, yet they are the brain's central command center for our emotional reactions. One of the simplest and strongest of these is fear, a primal emotion we all share. If you had to pick one brain region that was most important in fear, it would be the amygdala. What scientists discovered is that as humans evolved, another part of the brain, called the cortex, also became involved in processing fear. The part that makes us most human about the brain is our frontal cortex. If the amygdala is the first floor, the cortex is the second floor of the brain. It's the brain's thin, wrinkly outer layer that's divided into four sets of lobes. If you unfolded the cortex of a monkey, it would be about the size of a piece of paper. If you unfolded our cortex, it's about four sheets of paper large. And the reason it's wrinkly is because you have to squish that all inside of the skull. The frontal lobes comprise the area just above our eyes, and these are the newest rooms of the brain. As humans evolved, the frontal lobes became the place where conscious, rational thought is processed. It's where we do our problem solving. The frontal lobes are so interesting because they are really the conductor of the brain. They synchronize all activity. Scientists made a major breakthrough in fear research when they found that information from our senses reaches the amygdala almost twice as fast as it takes to get to our frontal lobes. The speed of the different brain signals means unless we instinctively know how to react to a potential threat, we may freeze in fear, waiting for the frontal lobes to catch up to figure out the right response. 
part of what happens with fear and panic is the unknown, is not knowing what to do next, and so your brain essentially freezes the way a deer freezes in the headlight. So the amygdala may get very fast signals about fear, um, even, but sometimes they're wrong, and quickly the situation may say to you, no, it's not a fear situation, and you're not afraid. So these very quick amygdala signals that you get can be controlled in sort of a top-down way. So she said the amygdala is very fast, but it can be controlled in a top-down way. So how is it controlled in a top-down way? It is mentioned that we have this learning brain. And this learning brain is made of four major lobes. The frontal lobe, which is right behind your forehead. The parietal lobe, which is just over the top. The temporal lobe on the side. Right? These are all two of them eh, on both sides, both, both hemisphere. So temporal lobe and then the occipital lobe, which is at the back. The frontal lobe is the part which governs all the thinking, all the rational thinking and all the, uh, all the decision making. So we're going to take a look at this frontal lobe. It is responsible for attention system. When we pay attention, that is when the frontal lobe is highly activated. And long-term memory is also stored there. It is responsible for logic. That means uh, rational thinking, critical thinking. It is responsible for lateral thinking, which is creativity and imagination. And also responsible for decision making, goal setting and planning. These are the important things that are processed in the frontal lobe. And finally, judgment, reasoning and rationalizing. That means realizing what is right from wrong. Right. So these are all the important functions of the frontal lobe. That's why it has been said that people who have very high forehead could be very intelligent people. Right. Uh, there, there could be some truth in it, but then you also have to be careful. Just because you have a lot of brain cells in that area does not, make, does not necessarily make you more intelligent, provided you use it. There are people with a lot of uh, brain cells in certain part of the brain, but they are not making use of it. You have a question? Okay, there, it goes by many names, right? Yeah. Cerebral cortex. We're talking about the third layer, the learning brain, the thinking brain. The whole thing is commonly called by different names, and but different names have slight differentiation. When you refer to the word just cortex, it's referring to all the six layers. When we speak of the cerebral cortex, it's the uppermost four layers. Right? There's also another name called the neocortex. Neo means newest or new. So neocortex means it's the new cortex. So all these are different names. Cerebrum, B-R, B, you know, there are two words, cerebrum and cerebrum. Cerebrum, spelled with R, also refers to the same thing, the cerebral cortex. But there is a part of the brain in the, in the old ancient part of the brain attached to the brain stem called the cerebellum, which you see there in blue. That cerebellum is responsible for, for aut autonomic actions, memory of automatic actions, reflex actions. They are stored there. Okay. So basically these are the various parts of the brain. In this case, it, it is the, we're talking about the, the outermost, layer, uh, outermost brain, the newest brain, the four main lobes, sets of lobes. So we're going to take a look at this decision-making, goal-setting, planning, judgment, reasoning, rationalizing. Okay? All these are happening in just a very little bit of the front, just behind your eyebrow, underneath there. That is actually now scientists are beginning to call that the fourth part of the brain. In the past, scientists were describing the brain as though there were three layers. Now they're beginning to realize that one, one particular part of the brain is being evolved, uh, continuously evolved, and that is the prefrontal cortex, PFC, prefrontal cortex. This is the very small part of the brain located just behind the eyebrow, right, at the curve. So that is the prefrontal cortex. This is in fact the most important part of the brain. The part of the brain that is responsible for decision making, goal setting,
planning, judgment, reasoning, rationalizing. Okay. So when we speak of experience, let's go through the, the whole cycle again so you have a refresher. When we speak of experience, the environment stimulates our sense organ, so we are able to see, hear, smell, taste, and touch from these stimulations. And then the process of perception arises. As I mentioned before, the process of perception is actually the activity of the five khandhas, like the five aggregates, as you call it. Right? The activity of the pancha khanda is the process of perception. And that gives rise to a perception in your mind. Vinyanya. Mind is made of three things. The arising of a perception, followed by the processing of this perception in a cognitive manner, which is to, which is to interpret what it is that you have just perceived, as well as processing this in an emotional manner or an effective manner called chitta. So, vinyanya, mano, chitta. These are the three activities that are going on in the mind. And when the effective process arises, it is, it is actually the arising of the emotional system where there is an unconscious emotional arousal that triggers biochemical chain reaction in the body, causing tensions in the body. With tensions in the body, right, then we begin to react. Let's take a look at this part called the amygdala, which is found inside the limbic system, the emotional brain that is responsible for all these emotional reactions. Now, the amygdala activity happens at the time when perception arises. When we sense something, the sensation of whatever that, that appears in front of us, the sensation of these things give rise to this vinyanya, and it is the arising of this perception where the amygdala begins to react. The amygdala has a shortcut. Every time it hears a loud noise or any signal that seems to be threatening, it begins to react by firing off biochemical chain reaction, even before the cognitive, cognitive mind and the affective mind is able to process this information. Before you can even think about it, the amygdala would fire off chain reaction. That's why when you're, when you're walking down the street, suddenly something comes towards you. Before you even have a chance to see what it is, you jump out of the way. That jumping out of the way is triggered by the amygdala. That's why the amygdala's reaction is there to save your life. But this jumping out of the way can also be very unhealthy. If it is unnecessarily aroused, it can, make, it can actually cause uh, deterioration in your health. So this dark purple path you see there is the quick path of the amygdala. And it triggers biochemical chain reaction even before the thinking mind can have a chance to understand and appreciate what has been perceived. All this is because of evolution. So we're going to talk a little bit about the evolutionary instincts. Right? Evolutionary instincts is the evolution of unconscious instinctive behavior. Things, the way our, our ancestors behave, they, the, the, the pattern of behavior begin to get programmed into our genes. And these genes are passed on generation after generation. So in every one of us, we have inherited genetic information about how our ancestors would have behaved in those days. Three very important instincts right, that has governed the survival of the human species or all animal species. In fact, this is all animal species. The first is the instinct to stay alive by searching for food, air, water, food, shelter, warmth, rest, basically staying alive, keeping the body alive, feeding the body. That is the first instinct, the self-preservation instinct. The second instinct is to avoid danger, avoid predators, so that we are not harmed by dangerous conditions. Such as, and this is through various evolutionary programming. When we hear loud noises, when we see fast approaching objects, all this causes us to feel the fear. And feeling the fear 
cause us to actually react and avoid the danger. So these are primal fears. And the third one is actually to reproduce. This is why animals naturally seek sex. And there's a difference between animals seeking sex versus human seeking sex. Generally, if you observe, animals seek sex for reproduction. They want to reproduce. They want to produce the next generation. The whole purpose of seeking sex by animals is to reproduce. Humans are the only species which seek sex, not necessarily for reproduction, for pleasure, for everything else. So that is the big difference between this uh, human and animal species as far as this third major, uh, primal instinct is concerned. These are three instincts that govern the behavior of all animals, not only human beings, but all animals. Let's listen to what Venerable Dr. Punanji has to say about this according to a very ancient teaching, an ancient shloka which describes these instincts. To start with, we have to start with the assumption that we are organisms in an environment. That's the main thing. We see ourselves not as even human beings. We have to see that we are organisms. Now, every plant is an organism, every animal is an organism, and human beings are also organisms. And it is through a gradual process of evolution that the human being was born with a more developed brain and a special part of the brain called the cerebrum <coughs> and which is doing the thinking. So all our thinking is even in an ancient uh, uh, Indian uh, verse Uh, this is, uh, I think, a Sanskrit verse where it says, Ahar nitra bhai maitunancha samanya metat pasubit narana dharmo hite sa maniko viseso dharme na hina pasubit samana. Now, what that means is, Taking food, ahara means taking food. Nitra means sleeping. Bhaya means fear. Maituna means sexual activities. Now these are things that human beings have in common with animals. Animals also eat, take food. They also sleep, they are also frightened, and they also have sexual activities. Ahar nitra bhai maitunancha saman metat pasvik narana dharma hitesa madiko visheso. That means, their dharma means this ability to think and reason out. That is what makes the human being special beyond the other animals. And that is because of that more developed brain which is especially the cerebrum. The uh, larger part of our brain is the cerebrum. So you see this in pictures today. You don't have to be just uh, imagining things. You see this in pictures. So what the Bhante was speaking of is this ancient 
Sanskrit shloka. Taking food, sleeping, avoiding dangers, sexual activities, these are common between animals and human beings. All animals and human beings behave in this manner. It is only the ability to think, to rationalize. Right? It is this ability where humans are unique. This is what makes humans different. And if we don't apply this, process, uh, this capability, then we are no different from other animals. Without thinking, rational thinking, humans are just like other animals, reacting to these instincts. Okay. So let's take a look at the process of experience when senses are stimulated and perceptions arise, cognitive process arise, affective process arise, and then biochemical chain reaction. This biochemical chain reaction is called the autonomous biochemical chain reaction. Autonomous because it arises automatically from within the body. Right? Autonomous is something that arises automatically within. This is the opposite of the word heteronomous. Heteronomous means something that arises because of conditions from external sources. So this is conditions from internal sources, internal to the body. And then that gives rise to the, the sensation, bodily sensation, which is felt. Now, as soon as this bodily sensation is being felt, something happens. Memory, imagination, expectation arises. When these arise, they trigger these unwholesome roots of conditioning. That means they remind us, they, they guide us to behave in a manner according to ancient instincts. And they give rise to the conditions of loba, dosa, and moha, which we'll talk about a little bit more further, in, uh, more deeper later on. But this is the time at which it arises, when biochemical activities in the body become felt as bodily sensation, then memory, imagination, expectation arise to help us deal with this. And very often, we deal with this in a very instinctive manner without thinking, through our natural animal instincts. And then we begin to form an intention. Now, now you can see that. An intention is chetana. We begin to form an intention to want to do something, and then we start to take action. The action we take is karma. So intention is chetana. The action we take as a result of the intention that is karma. When you take action, something happens. You create certain consequences, outcomes. And these consequences is what is known as vipaka. It's very important to understand at this point in time, the word karma is very often misused, especially in Western world. A lot of Westerners have a misunderstanding the word karma, thinking that karma is the result of your action. But it is not. It is the, the actual action itself. Vipaka is the result of your action. Karma is your action, what you do. And what you do conditions Vipaka. So what you do is karma, action. And it conditions the outcome, the consequences, which is Vipaka. Brother, you have a question? Well, intention could be the result of past karma. But then again, here we're just focusing on a scientific process. So we're not going to talk about past life or past karma. But basically, you have an intention. Yeah, it could be that you want to kill someone because of past experiences, past things that has happened between you and that person. So previous karma lead to this present condition where you now have an intention to want to do something to that person. Right? So it could be previous actions by that person or by yourself. So in other words, it's previous karma. Yeah? But karma here is action, not consequence. But the Western world very often confuses the word karma with vipaka, calling karma as though it is the consequence. So bear in mind, Consequence of your action is vipaka. 
right? At any time, the intention is very much driven by the whole process of vinyanya, mano, and citta. And it is, in fact, very strongly driven by the citta part, especially memory, imagination, expectation, that drives your act, intention to act. Okay. So we've spoke about these conditions where the, the brain triggers various organs and then biochemical chain reaction happening throughout the body, leading to the whole body to react. Okay. So I'm not going to go through that one more time. Basically, the whole body reacts because of those uh, adrenaline and cortisol. These are these, uh, stressful hormones. Our body is often filled with various hormones of different types. Here, I'm only speaking of stress-related stress hormones, adrenaline and cortisol. But there are other good hormones which I'll talk about later. Or rather hormones that help us become more peaceful. Okay. So adrenaline, what does it do? It actually causes body to get ready. It is the action hormone. Cortisol, what does it do? It is the stress hormone re reacting to stress conditions. And it causes unhealthy conditions in the body, increasing blood sugar level, suppressing immune system, suppressing digestive system. It even, in fact, causes degradation of bone formation, decreases bone formation. Okay. Let's take a look at um, the two types of hormone. Cortisol is a stress hormone. As I mentioned to you before, there are positive hormones uh, or good hormones. Oxytocin is a good hormone. It is the hormone of bonding. Some call it the hormone of love. But it is basically best described as the hormone of bonding, the hormone of empathy. Oxytocin will be released in large amount in a woman, especially when the woman has a child, has a baby, uh, a mother, a young mother carrying the baby. The moment the young mother picks up her baby, naturally the brain reacts by releasing oxytocin because of the bonding. This is why mothers bond with their babies very well. So now let's take a look at the comparison of oxytocin uh, a comparison of cortisol, which is the stress hormone, with oxytocin, which is the hormone of empathy, hormone of love. Oxytocin, the hormone of love, versus cortisol, the stress hormone. Humans have two opposing hormonal responses to stimuli. Threatening stimuli cause an increase of stress hormones called adrenaline and cortisol. Comforting or reassuring stimuli cause an increase in oxytocin, the hormone of love. The fight or flight response triggered by a sudden threat or a stressful situation is associated with the hormone adrenaline. Adrenaline causes increase in heart rate, speeds up respiration, activates muscles, and creates hyperalert energy. This hormone empowers you to immediately act your way out of danger. The activation of adrenaline is deemed healthy for the body at times. However, when the stress stays for long, it increases the level of another hormone called cortisol. To cope with stress, cortisol begins to break down non-essential organs and tissues to maintain blood sugar and to feed vital organs. When cortisol stays at high levels, it automatically digests bones, muscles, and joints, resulting to elevated blood fats and sugar, which are related to many disorders. The most common stressors nowadays are more likely emotional and mental than physical. Pressure from job, family problems, fear-producing media materials, and relationship issues are among the top 10 causes of stress. Even though they are non-physical threats, your body has only one response to this scenario, and that is to produce more cortisol. These emotional and mental stressors are indirectly linked to the body's physical condition. 
The good news is that your body has built-in mechanism for countering stress. Oxytocin counters the effects of rise in cortisol levels. The anti-stress effect of oxytocin helps your body restore your health naturally. Oxytocin also induces emotional bonding, labor, and lactation. All the negative effects of continued stress on the body and mind are related to elevated levels of cortisol. This include chronic anxiety and depression, emotional overreaction, negativity, weight gain, heart disease, high blood pressure, and weakened immunity. Oxytocin, by countering cortisol, can amend all of these conditions. So you can see the body releases various kinds of hormones. There are some hormones that are useful, and some hormones can be destructive to your health. And cortisol is one which is definitely this harmful to your health. So when we begin to react, we create consequences in our environment. Consequences are two types, uh, vipaka, internal vipaka and external vipaka. Internal consequences are basically the stress that we are experiencing. And about 70, 80 years ago, a new, new, um, endocrinologist by the name of Hans Selle, he described this condition as stress, and he called it the general adaptation syndrome. He described it as three levels, alarm reaction, stage of resistance, and stage of exhaustion. Alarm reaction is when we sense threat and then we, we begin to, the body begins to react. Stage of resistance is the bodily reaction to stress. And finally, when this reaction has reached its extreme point, it is the stage of exhaustion. Somebody mentioned about, oh, how is this, uh, uh, what do you call that, uh, post-traumatic st uh, stress disorder? How is it that people get so depressed, then they, they, they go, go cuckoo and end up in Tanjo Rambutan? Basically, it reaches the stage of exhaustion, where the mind can no longer control the conditions of these things happening. This is also described by the Buddha, actually. Although Hanseli described it at three stages, these are also precisely described by the Buddha as grief, sorrow, which is soka, parideva. So soka and parideva are the alarm reaction. When stress arises, we begin to experience it, we begin to feel it, and we begin to react to it. The actual reaction is physical pain, dukkha, or emotional pain, domanasa. Okay? And then when we are unable to cope with it, it overwhelms us, then this is a stage of exhaustion called upayasa. Okay? So these are already described by the Buddha as the five levels of stress. There are also external consequences, and these external consequences are things like in relation to the opposite party, what we do to other people. There is also in relation to the society, the community around us. Also in relation to the law of the land, that means we may commit a crime against the law, or we may do things to destroy environment or property, or it may even affect our next life, or our rebirth, matters arising after death. So when we look at all these situations of, of uh, disturbances, what disturbs the mind? What makes the mind react in such negative way? When we are aroused and biochemical chain reaction happen, this autonomic Autonomous biochemical chain reaction causes these bodily sensations and we have memory, imagination, expectation arising. This is the time when we have to be very careful. If we are not mindful, if we allow the memory, imagination, expectation to run wild, it takes control of all our thinking. Because this is what we call mental proliferation. The mind being proliferated by various kinds of unwholesome thinking. 
So this mental proliferation can control our rational thinking. That, and this, this mental proliferation is a very emotional state. Right? The, in other words, emotions overwhelms our thinking. So feeling take over thinking. Because it's a tug of war between feeling and thinking. Now, we, we often have this experience. Sometimes certain emotions tell us to do things in one way. But our rational thinking tells us to do things in another way. When we are faced with this tug of war between emotions and rational thinking, usually which one wins? Emotion wins or rational thinking wins? Most of the time. Emotions. There is a very strong scientific explanation behind why emotion wins all the time. Okay. In fact, not even most of the time. Almost all the time. There is this tug of war that goes on whenever we experience these conditions. Five, four, three... Two, one, two. And when we try to control them, we start a tug of war between our brain's oldest and newest parts. While ancient structures like the amygdala respond to threats by trying to turn our anger or fear on, it's newer structures, such as the prefrontal cortex, the thinking part of our brain, that try to turn them off. It's the tug of war between these two systems that gives rise to our emotions. At New York University, Neuroscientist Joseph Ledoux has studied how the amygdala and the cortex shape our emotional responses. You know more about the amygdala than anybody alive, and you still can't control yours. No. Why? Now, there's an interesting thing, again, that has to do with the wiring of the brain. This is if we could just look at it here. So this is the human brain inside a skull. And the prefrontal cortex is here in the front, right behind your forehead. And that is the, the newest part of the, the brain. This is where we make our decisions. This is where we plan for the future um, and strategize. The lateral prefrontal cortex has no connectivity with the amygdala. The amygdala has super highways to talk to the cortex, but the prefrontal cortex has only back roads and side streets to get to the amygdala. And therefore, it is unable to tell the amygdala, cool it. But why are there no connections? We're in the process of evolving as we speak, and those connections have not been put in yet. This thing was built to do fancy things cognitively, not necessarily to control our emotions. So as you can see, the emotional part of our brain, uh, the amygdala, has very strong connections to our thinking brain. So it is able to send messages to disturb the thinking brain easily. But at the same time, the thinking brain has very weak connections going back to the amygdala to control the amygdala. So in other words, naturally, the way our brain has evolved at the present level, the emotional part of the brain has very strong control over the thinking part of our brain. And it is sabotaging our thinking all the time. So we have to be aware of our emotional thoughts. Because the emotional thoughts can control all our decision making. And this process where emotions arise and begin to disturb our thinking, right, it gives rise to imagination, memory, and expectation. I call this the IME syndrome or I, me syndrome. In fact, it is this process that makes us realize in a strong way there is this self. Right? The idea of the self is very strong here. Right? That's why it's the I-me syndrome. Everything that happens, we begin to imagine what can happen to us next. Everything that happens around us, we begin to remember what happened in the past that affected us. Everything that happens around us, we begin to have expectations. So all these Imagining what can happen to us in the future, remembering what has happened to us in the past, and expectation of what is, going to, what is going to change in the present moment, these are all very self-centered. That's why the sense of self becomes strengthened 
when imagination, memory, expectation arise to take control of our thinking. And this process is called the cognitive dissonance. When reasoning, rational thinking is pulling our mind, decision-making in one direction, and feeling, which is the emotional part, the affective process, with emotional beliefs, is pulling in the opposite direction. Now, when these two things pull in opposite direction, as, as we all agreed, we basically make decisions according to our feeling more. So we actually make decisions more based on feelings and emotions. But human beings are very clever organisms. When feelings and reasoning pull in opposite directions, we experience this condition called cognitive dissonance. But we all invariably react according to feelings more. And then when we react according to feelings, we often justify this reaction through a process of very clever reasoning. Give a very simple example. How many of you like to eat durians? Be honest. How many of you like durian? So quite a few people like to eat durian. Can you think of a good reason why you should eat durian instead of other more healthy fruits? Huh? Tastes good. Emotions. But I'm asking for rational explanation. There is almost no rational explanation why you should eat durian. But at the same time, I've heard people come up with a very nice justification. We call it justification. It says, oh, durian is something where people get together, you experience fellowship, you have a little durian party. But my, my question to you is, do you necessarily need to have durian? Can't you have a healthy fruit like guava? Instead of having a durian party, can't you have a guava party? But have you ever heard of people having guava party? No. They, but have you heard of people having durian party? Yes. Right? So we're very clever organisms. And this is what's happening to us. We justify our emotional decision. Almost all decisions we make are emotionally centered. Right? In fact, this has been explained thoroughly by one of the top brain scientists in the world. You saw him at the last, uh, at the last uh, talk where he talked about the self and the body. Antonio Damasio, he's the professor of neuroscience in the University of Southern California. He says, It is wrong to say that the mind is able to think independently from the body, meaning the mind and the body are interconnected. And this is for normal beings, that the mind and the body are interconnected. There is a very critical role of this thing called gut feeling. Gut feeling is actually the emotional response that causes biochemical changes in the body. He says there's a very critical role of this gut feeling in helping us to navigate endless stream of decision making in our lives. Okay? And we do this by drawing on memory of past experiences and we do this by personalizing the body's experiences. And this gut feeling leads us to reject certain course of action. In other words, certain rational action we reject. We basically re react according to emotions. Because emotions are easy to decide. Once we feel something, we just make a decision according to how we feel. Very easy to decide. No need to justify that. So it allows us to choose easily amongst very few alternatives of how we feel. And that's what we always do. We make decisions according to how we feel. And listen to what he says now. All the things that you go through in your life in terms of decisions are inevitably accompanied by some kind of emotion, positive or negative. Each decision has some kind of similarity with a decision of the past. And when you are in a position to decide once again, you will call up an emotional memory that will appear as a gut feeling and will lead you in one direction or another. So what you have is a, literally a navigational aid, something that helps you get to the right decision. 
And if that is broken down, then you are at the mercy of facts and logic. And that's just not good enough. So, we often find facts and logics very difficult to deal with. Emotions are easier to deal with. The moment we feel something, we just do according to how we feel. So that leads us to the main part of our discussion, our sharing. Some of you will recognize the image on the right-hand side, and this is actually found in a lot of tankas of Tibetan Buddhism, but uh, you also find it, I think, in various images. Now, in the center, you will notice there are three animals. Anybody has any idea what these three animals represent? Okay. This is actually a, I don't know how these three animals came about, but it is a common representation amongst other traditions and to, to describe the condition of Loba, Dosa, Moha. Loba, Dosa, Moha are these three, these three roots of conditioning called Akusala Mula. Kusala is wholesome. When you put an A in front, it is opposite. So Akusala means unwholesome. Mula, actually, all of us would know uh, from Bahasa. The Bahasa language is derived from Sanskrit. Pali is, descri- is derived from Sanskrit. What does Mula mean? Beginning. Right? Mula means beginning. So this is actually how it all originated. The roots of conditioning. The beginning of how we get conditioned. The unwholesome way that we get conditioned into Loba, Dosa, Moha. The chicken is often used to represent Loba, which is lust, greed, and craving. What does a chicken do all day? It just continuously packs for food. Does it ever stop? Almost never. It's only when when it has to drink or when it has to run away away from predators. But otherwise, all day long, the chicken will be packing for food. Non-stop. So that's why it's used as a representation of greed, never-ending, uh, continuous lust for food. Dosa is ha- aversion, uh, avoiding pain, uh, hatred for anything that is unpleasant, ill will. In, in fact, this often leads to anger and anger reaction. And the snake is used to represent that. So these are the The two animals. The third animal is describing ignorance, right? And they use the wild boar. Basically, because uh, in the wild, uh, you can see this in the wild. In fact, even the pigs in the farm are the same. The reason why it is used to describe moha is perhaps because of the ear. The ear of the pig is so long that it flaps over. When it flaps over, it covers the eyes. And then you become delusional. You're not able to see the reality. So, Moha is referring to the ignorance and the delusion of existence. So, Loba, Dosa, Moha. When something that is pleasurable arises, we will react in a manner called Loba. That means it's pleasant, it's pleasurable, we want more of it. When something that is unpleasant or painful arises, we react in a way which is called Dosa. That is to try to avoid it, to get rid of it. We may even have a hatred for it, an anger for it, ill will towards it. So basically this is Loba and Dosa. When we are uncertain of our reactions, when we begin to experience something that reminds us of our existence, then we begin to become delusional. Right? We, we become ignorant about the realities of life. And we spoke of the realities of life the last time. That is basically the anicca, uncertainty, dukkha, the suffering, and anatta, that life is impersonal. We, we become ignorant to these things. And then we begin to become delusional. Right? So let's take a look at Loba Dosa Moha from a scientific perspective, where we where we have uh, examined already, but let's go through it one more time. There is no objective decision-making. Everything is very much dependent on emotions. And emotion is driven by past experiences. So there is no objective thing when it comes to decision-making. 
It is our past experiences that influence all decisions. And in the past, in ancient times, people speak of emotion as though it is something which is spiritual in nature. And in fact, in the past, even ancient scientists thought that emotion is something that is purely mental. But people have begun to realize now, scientists have now uh, come to the consensus, emotion is not just mental thoughts or negative thoughts. It is also something that has to do with the body. Emotion incorporates these biochemical processes. And these biochemical processes involve these things called peptides. Peptides is a kind of, of biochemicals in the body. And these peptides trigger various sensations in the body. Right? Pleasure sensations, pain sensations. And this peptide will bind to receptor cells in the body. When a lot of certain types of peptides arise, are released and they are binded to various receptor cells in the body, in that part of the body, then we experience certain sensations in that part of the body. So when we begin to react, all emotional reactions are nothing but reactions to both the mental as well as the physiological conditioning. Physiological is this condition of the peptides. So let's take a look at what this peptide is all about. Our experiences color what we know. So there is no completely objective appraisal of anything because our appraisal of everything has to do with our previous experiences and our emotions. Everything has an emotional weighting to it. We've gone from uh, emotions being these spiritual, immaterial things to things, they're not even things, to actual molecules with molecular weights and peptides with sequences and structures. Science knows now that, that the hypothalamus makes peptides are strong chemicals. Well, here's the story of the peptide in the cell. The peptides bind the receptors and dock onto them and stay attached. Then they come off and then they can come back on again. And while they're there, they are changing the cell. A receptor that has a peptide sitting in it sets off a whole cascade of biochemical events, some of which changes nucleus of the cell. Each cell is definitely alive, and uh, each cell has a consciousness, particularly if we define consciousness as the point of view of an observer. There is always a perspective of the cell. The cell knows where it is, the cell knows where it's going, the cell knows what proteins it's making. The cell knows whether it's about to divide or whether it's in a program to stop dividing. In fact, the cell is the smallest unit of consciousness in the body. I'm hungry. Things are yelling up to the brain saying, we have gotten our fix today and it's going to start sending impressions to the brain and the brain is going to start to formulate imagery it's going to sound like voices in our head I'm hungry. to think of a reason why we should be depressed think of a reason why we should be confused think of a reason for our own suffering and the body is going to be telling the brain that it's not getting its chemical need chemical needs met and so the brain will then activate and start going to our past situations and flashing pictures to our frontal lobe. Oh yeah! We've commandeered an entire serving planet! Yeah! 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 Oh yeah! So basically the, the bodily sensation is caused by these, the cells in our body receiving peptides and these peptides bond to the cells and trigger reactions in cells. So various cells in the body get triggered and it causes sensations in the body. And we begin to react to these sensations. If it's pleasurable, we want more of it. If it is unpleasant, we want to get rid of it. So when we speak of pleasant and pleasurable sensations, we begin to want to have more of it. So let's take a look at this explanation of lust 
and greed for pleasurable sensations. Loba. <laughs> In Seattle, Washington, scientists are attempting to map the exact neural architecture of human sexuality. Dr. Ken Maravilla investigates how lust and sexuality affect each part of the human brain. He uses two technologies. One is the MRI machine. The other technology is a simple DVD player. Our subjects are presented a uh, stimulus that consists of sexually explicit scenes that promote their ability to become aroused in the magnet. The experiment is simple. Subjects are shown neutral videos to get a baseline. Then images become more sexually explicit for several minutes while Maravilla and his staff voyeuristically watch as the subject's brains change. We have areas in the frontal lobes that are associated with reward and pleasant feelings and these become active with arousal. The amygdala often becomes activated and this is one of the decision-making evaluative areas of the brain. The MRI shows that as subjects are sexually aroused, there is an intriguing corollary to the new findings. We also found that certain areas of the brain seem to become less active. And they appear to be areas that are related to of inhibition, if you will. When the lust areas of the brain light up, the judgment areas of the brain begin to turn off. The conclusion? The more aroused a person, the less access they have to clear judgment. It would seem that science shows a direct connection between lust and poor judgment. The theory supports the basic premise of sociologists studying this area of human behavior. Sins are good, they're adaptive. Sexual desire is normal and appropriate and healthy. Lust is a term we give when there's too much of it or it's inappropriate. By this definition, something becomes a sin when it is destructive. It would seem that according to science, it is less a matter of going to hell than going too far. We have a natural tendency to want to go too far when we, when we feel pleasurable because this bodily sensation keeps driving us on, feeding the lust, feeding us to want to respond positively to this pleasurable sensation. And that is loba. Let's take a look at dosa, hatred. Hatred of something which you perceive to be threatening to you, to be painful to you. And here is a story of a man who killed his own mother because he, he thought that the mother was a threat to his own survival when the mother decided to ask him to, <clears throat> to move out of the house. Today, some I have to restart this. <coughs> yeah. Today, scientists are beginning to examine exactly where anger comes from. The brain perceives a lot of information, both from the outside world and from inside the body. And there is one part of the brain called the amygdala that serves the function of sifting through all that information and asking one question. Is this a threat? Is this something I should worry about? Dr. Ruben Gurr has zeroed in on the amygdala as the key instigator of anger. This walnut-sized lobe can quickly overwhelm the brain with uncontrollable rage. 
Once there is a perception of danger, there is a cascade of responses in the body that includes changes in heart rate, in blood pressure, in sweating. It makes your body ready to fight or flee. The amygdala is a primitive part of the brain. It exists because the human brain is made up of layers that were added on top of each other over the millions of years of evolution. All those other older brains are still alive and well inside your own brain. So you have a part of you that thinks like a dog, and you have a part of you that thinks like a crocodile, and a part of you that thinks like a monkey. The amygdala creates an automatic fight-or-flight response to threats. But human beings have evolved another part of the brain, the frontal lobes. This area that you can see here in the front is the orbital frontal region. And the orbital frontal regions are like brakes for the amygdala. If you can think of the amygdala as being the engine for the threat response, the orbital frontal is the brakes. If Dr. Gur is correct, then a person who is overwhelmed by anger is literally, temporarily insane until his amygdala can be controlled. Case in point, the 2003 murder of Betty Dodge by her son James Essek. At the time of the crime, Essek was an adult with mental problems who had moved in with his mother. Their relationship deteriorated so badly that Dodge asked her son to move out. And that set him into a panic. And he grabbed a sculpture that they had and broke it on her head and kept hitting her repeatedly until she was dead. And then he went across the street, turned himself into the police. During the court case, Dr. Gurr was hired as an expert witness and asked to evaluate the mental capacity of Essek. He did a complete neuroscan of his brain and found that 30 to 40 percent of the tissue was missing in the orbital frontal area. So when the amygdala was saying, I'm in danger, I'm furious, attack, there was not enough tissue in the front to say, calm down. You have better ways of dealing with this situation than attacking what you think is the source of your fear and anger. The jury agreed with Dr. Gurr's testimony and ruled that James Essek was innocent by reason of insanity. He was sent to a mental hospital for treatment. Some might say James Essek was incapable of controlling his ability to sin. The organ of our mind and what controls our behavior is the brain, and his brain is damaged. But by the time an angry act results in prison or a mental hospital, the damage is done. Is there a way to treat human rage before it gets to this critical breaking point? So actually when we become angry or even lustful, the amygdala is highly aroused. And the only way to really control that is through the prefrontal cortex, the thinking brain. Now, that particular person so happened to have a deficiency in the thinking brain. About 30% of the tissues are missing. So in other words, his thinking brain is even far weaker than the normal thinking brain. Therefore, he has very little chance of controlling his emotion. But in the case of the rest of us, we can train our thinking brain to control the emotion. And this training of thinking brain is a very simple process called mindfulness. So by training our level of mindfulness, we are able to control our emotions easily. So the practice of mindfulness and mindfulness meditation can help us overcome our emotional arousal and emotional reactions. You will find that almost in all cases of emotional reaction, whether it is loba, dosa, or moha, the amygdala is largely responsible. And as we said earlier, the amygdala has very strong connections to the thinking brain. Therefore, we need to train our thinking brain 
to overcome this condition. Right? And that training is best done through meditation. So now let's look at this condition of moha, the indifference and the ignorance that arises when we are not able to judge between what is right and wrong. So in this case, you're going to look at the case study of a man who suffered from a stroke. And after the stroke, his brain is damaged in a, in a very unusual way. It is damaged that he cannot feel bodily sensation. He may be happy and he's smiling, but he doesn't realize he's smiling. He doesn't realize he's happy. So he actually is unable to experience his own bodily sensation. And then he becomes confused with what he's thinking. Right? So this is a, a scientific explanation that this ignorance, confusion, delusion can arise when we are not capable of clearly distinguishing what kind of bodily sensations we experience. At 56, Marvin Bateman is a shadow of the young husband and father he once was. A stroke has left him paralyzed on one side of his body. But its most devastating impact is less visible. He has been cut off from his emotions. At the University of Iowa, researchers are trying to understand why Marvin cannot feel a simple emotion like fear. A scan shows the stark region where Marvin's brain has died. The core of the damage is in areas that have to do with creating a feeling. It's not that he has lost the ability to produce an emotion. The losses have more to do with the ability to feel the emotions that he produces. You can see it on Marvin's face. A smile, a laugh, a scowl of frustration. But what he does not experience is the awareness of emotion. Emotions are generated by structures hidden deep in the brain. The tiny almond-shaped amygdala is the first to respond to an emotional event, triggering a series of split-second reactions within the brain's emotional core. Waves of nerve impulses travel down the brain stem, setting off an instantaneous visceral response throughout the body. A lot of the time, the machinery that produces the emotion is operating without us noticing it at all. Creating changes in posture and facial expression, altering the way the organs inside the body are working, preparing the body for what's needed next, generating chemical responses that you will never know existed. And all of this is what constitutes the emotional state. For most people, awareness of a feeling follows just milliseconds after an emotion is created. The body sends signals back to the area of the brain responsible for conscious thought, making us aware of our feelings. It is in this region of emotional awareness that Marvin's stroke decimated hundreds of millions of brain cells. Marvin experiences emotion, his body responds. But when the physical response is communicated back to his thinking brain, the signal falls into a void. Marvin can only guess at what he or others may be feeling. When you're married, there's an emotional connection between two people. That connection is no longer there. It's like somebody cut that wire between the two of us. If I try and talk to him, you know, about something that's bothering me, or, um, well, I just need somebody to listen. He's just not there for me. There's no empathy or sympathy. He just can't get that feeling. And he knows it should come, but it just won't. So this is a case where a person begins to experience delusions 
because he's unable to sense his own emotional reaction. He's unable to sense his own bodily conditions, whether he's feeling good or not feeling good. So with all these things disturbing the mind, how can we cultivate peace of mind? What is really, before we talk about cultivating peace of mind, let's just understand what is really peace of mind. Peace of mind is basically a mind that is free from mental proliferation. That means the mind is no longer disturbed by imagination, memory, and expectation. Imagination, memory, and expectation. What I call the I-M-E syndrome. The I-Me syndrome. Because they are centered around the self, the me. So when we can free ourselves from this syndrome, then we will be able to experience peace of mind. So let's look at the process we can go about doing that. When we begin to feel stressed, how can we free ourselves from these stressful conditions of daily life? We can cultivate peace of mind in two simple steps. First is to allow, but you know, when, when we are stressed, when we become angry, when we become anxious, uh, anxious, when we become frustrated, we just allow this biochemical chain reaction to subside by physical relaxation. So the first step is to learn how to relax. This will help to break this biochemical chain reaction. That means stop the biochemical chain reaction from becoming continuously uh, a chain reaction. Break that chain. The second step is to calm our emotional arousal by training our mind to become more mindful. And I'll mention briefly about that. And this will help us avoid mental proliferation. That means the mind is focused, right? the mind is, is mindful, it is focused on the present moment, it is not judgmental. We're going to talk a, a little bit about that later on. So two steps. Physical relaxation is the first one, followed by calming through mindfulness training. So this is actually discovered by a uh, medical doctor. Uh, from a scientific perspective, it was discovered by a medical doctor by the name of Herbert Benson. And he called this the relaxation response. And in fact, he was actually referring also to the use of meditation to help people to overcome these conditions. Using modern technology, Benson is trying to understand how meditation appears to reverse the body's natural stress response. What we are finding is that for centuries upon centuries, people had discovered that there's something they could do to counteract the harmful effects of stress. Benson named it the relaxation response. It's the body's innate ability to lower blood pressure, reduce heart rate, and slow breathing. We are fortunate that we have within us a response opposite to the fight or flight response. That is the relaxation response. And there are scores of techniques but in all of them, two steps are needed. The first is a repetition, a word, a sound, a movement. The second is freeing your mind of thought by concentrating on that repetition. And everyone can do it. The relaxation response can be triggered by all kinds of activity. From the repetition of a prayer, to the primal beat of dancing. Even the rhythm of exercise can reverse the harmful effects of stress. So how does it work? At an MRI facility in Boston, Herbert Benson's colleague Sarah Lazar is looking inside the brain for an answer. 
Her subject is a Tai Chi master, Ramel Rones. He has over 20 years of meditation experience. Ramel has been fitted with equipment to monitor his body temperature and breathing. What are we doing now? We're going to do the meditation scan now. So you're going to lie there quietly for a few minutes and then you're going to begin the meditation. As Ramel begins his meditation, the MRI scanner takes a series of snapshots inside his brain. Over the next 10 minutes, Ramel will try to empty his mind of thought. As Ramel meditates, his breathing slows to four breaths a minute, and his body temperature drops. Inside his brain, activity also slows down, but incredibly, the MRI scan reveals that certain areas have become more active. The red spots show activity. As well as controlling our heart and breathing rate, these are the parts of the brain that control alertness, decision-making, and emotion. It suggests that in a state of meditation, the mind is not only more alert, but that we are able to control our emotional response to stressful situations. Jude Meadows is part of a growing band of people using these ancient techniques to deal with the demands of the modern world. For three years, she has been meditating to promote the relaxation response and reduce her stress levels. Learning Transcendental Meditation is the most significant thing I've ever done in my life. It's made a huge difference to me on a health basis. I feel different and um, I've seen a difference in the way in which I work. You have that much more focus and clarity. You could achieve the same results but with less effort. I stopped working weekends and evenings and started to get a bit of a life. So for me, it's the best thing I've ever done. In a world where stress can pursue us like a predator, managing its harmful effects is critical to safeguarding our mental and physical health. So meditation is by far the most powerful way to overcome these conditions of mental disturbances that lead to loba, dosa, and moha. And I'm using here a very simple explanation of this relaxation response. First is to relax the body by pausing whatever that is going on that is disturbing you, causing you to get upset, getting angry, getting anxious, pause and relax. Because when you pause and relax, the biochemical activities in your body gradually subside. They slow down. So when, when biochemical activities gradually subside, they wear off. They wear away. And as they wear away, the tension in the body eases. Your body becomes less and less tensed. And the mind is no longer disturbed by this tension. Your, your body is now more relaxed the mind is no longer disturbed by the, the bodily tensions and bodily sensations. Because a relaxed body is a necessary condition for a calm mind. Then you begin to calm the mind. To calm the mind through mindful attention. To be able to pay attention to the present moment. The relaxed body suggests there is an absence of threats. So your mind doesn't, real, doesn't feel there is anything that is threatening. And when you pay conscious, focused attention to the present moment, your mind begins to calm down very quickly because it is no longer drawing on memory, imagination, and expectation. The mind calms down very quickly. There are no further arousal of biochemical chain reactions. Because your mind is no longer thinking of the past, the future, or expecting something to change in the present moment. It is this imagination, memory, and expectation that leads to mental disturbances. So by calming the mind and 
bringing the mind to the present moment, it is no longer thinking about yesterday's problems or tomorrow's anxieties or whatever you expect to happen in the present moment and so on. Just stay focused to this moment and then the whole body will, will relax and the mind will calm down very quickly through mindful attention. Okay? The first part when you relax the body, you are breaking the biochemical chain reaction. By relaxing the body, you are stopping further disturbances by biochemical reactions in the body. You are allowing it to wear off, wear away, and then there is no longer disturbances. By mindful attention to calm the mind, you are avoiding mental proliferation, avoiding distractions from memory, imagination, and expectation. This is how you can actually help cultivate peace of mind. It's very important to understand this. When you learn meditation, whoever is teaching you meditation, the first thing he must teach you is how to relax. Very importantly, how to relax the body and how to release tensions from your mind. Allow the body to physically relax and let the mind to gradually come to a, a state of calmness. Now, it is very important that a good meditation teacher should start teaching you this. So if you are learning meditation from someone, it is important that this person helps you learn how to relax. So if we look at this whole process one more time and see how it affects us, when this mental proliferation arises, it disturbs our thinking mind, our cognitive process, our rational thinking. And it is this moment that you must learn to relax. So you learn to pause. Whatever you are doing, just pause and relax. And then pay mindful attention to the present moment. When you do that, you are actually bypassing the arousal of the affective process. You are reducing the effect of emotional arousal. And by doing that, you are actually blocking out the, in the I-me syndrome, imagination, memory, and expectation. This mindful attention is the practice of introspection, the practice of what we call mindfulness. Right? For lack of a better word, we use the word mindfulness. But actually, the, the better word is introspection, to turn your attention inwards, to inspect what goes on in the mind. Right? So this is by learning a process of meditation called the Satipatthana. Uh, okay, I'll come to that in a moment. So what is this introspection? This introspection is very focused attention, sustained focus attention. Attention on what? Attention on the present moment. How? Attention on the present moment in an introspective manner. That means you observe what goes on in your mind. Be non-judgmental what goes on in your mind. And be purposeful. Observe and allow the mind to calm down. So basically this is the process of introspection. I'm not here to explain how to practice Satipatthana. But I'll, I'm just using Satipatthana as the, as the example that if you practice this mindfulness meditation, it will help you learn how to overcome these mental disturbances. So let's take a look at the explanation of the word Satipatthana according to my teacher, Venerable Dr. Punaji. He basically broke down the word Satipatthana into three words, Sati, Upa, and Tana. Sati means attention, Upa means within, Tana means to place. So Satipatthana is really meaning to place your attention within. The introversion of your attention. And this is what introspection is all about. To turn your attention inwards and observe internally what goes on in your mind. The word sati is commonly translated as mindfulness. Sometimes it's also translated as recollection. Okay? 
So basically, the more accurate translation is attention, to place the attention inwards. So let's listen to what Bhante Punaji has to say about why we need to practice Satipatthana. Normally, we experience conflict. What is this thing called conflict? Our mind can be divided into two parts. What we call the thinking part and the emotional part. The emotional part is something that cannot think. Emotions cannot think. Emotions only want things or hate things or become angry or become frightened or become worried. That is emotion. And emotions are blind. Emotions are not able to become aware of anything. We become aware of the world, we become aware of what is right and wrong, good and bad, all that is done by the thinking part of the mind. What we pointed out was that today the modern scientists who are doing research on the brain they have found that there are two areas in the brain. One area does the thinking and the other area does the emotional excitement. So what we have to do is try to shut off the emotional part and try to keep the thinking part alive. That is the part that becomes conscious of the world. The emotional part all works unconsciously. So instead of letting the emotional part rise up and do all the bad things, we should shut off the emotional part and start making use of the thinking part and become conscious. And that is what today the Buddha called Satipatthana. Satipatthana, today translated as mindfulness. My translation is not mindfulness. Satipatthana means the introversion of attention. Normally our attention is extroverted. That means we are focusing on what we see, what we hear, what we smell, what we taste and what we touch. And when we keep on focusing on what we see, hear, smell, taste, touch, we begin to react to the pleasant sights, the unpleasant sights, the pleasant sounds, the unpleasant sounds, the pleasant smells, the unpleasant smells, the pleasant taste, the unpleasant taste, and the pleasant touches and the unpleasant touches. We are all the time reacting to these things because our attention is focused on what we see, hear, smell, taste, touch. Now, instead of doing that, what the Buddha points out is focus on what is going on inside you. What is going on inside you is your desires, your hatreds, your fears, your worries, when you become conscious of these things, they automatically stop. 
they can go on only unconsciously. Desires can go on only unconsciously. Hatreds can go on only unconsciously. Fears can go on only unconsciously. Worries can go on only unconsciously. The moment you become conscious, it stops. This is the important thing to understand. But there is a small unfortunate problem. The stopping of the emotions doesn't happen suddenly. It is like turning off the hot plate. If you switch off the hot plate, the heat don't, doesn't disappear all at once. But you switch off the light, the light disappears immediately. But the hot plate doesn't disappear immediately. Even the fan doesn't disappear immediately when you switch it off. It will start turning for some time and gradually it will calm down. Heat is also like that. It is only light that goes off immediately. So this is important to understand. In a similar way, the emotions, when you are angry, if you look at the anger and say, oh, I am angry. And if you can simply look at the anger, the anger will gradually subside. But if you say, think, oh, I looked at the anger, but the anger didn't disappear, it's still going on, and you become angry about the anger, and then, of course, the anger will keep on <laughs> becoming more and more. But if you can just relax, look at the anger and relax, the anger will slowly calm down. That's how it goes. The important thing is to become conscious of this unconscious process that is going on. And that becoming conscious of these unconscious processes is what we call satipatthana. What is called satipatthana, which is today translated as mindfulness, is simply becoming conscious of the unconscious processes. That is the important thing to understand. So, to be conscious of the unconscious, and that is the practice of satipatthana, that when we are disturbed, right, when we are disturbed by memory, imagination, expectation, leading to loba, dosa, moha, disturbing our rational thinking, pause, relax, mindful attention, becoming conscious of what has happened, and through introspection, the introversion of attention, focus attention on the present moment, introspectively, non-judgmental, and purposefully. Okay. And now I'm going to present to you a very important thing. Uh, this is how we deal with these memory, imagination, expectation when they arise. When memory arises, it brings up the past. We think about past experiences. Now, one of the important things about a human being is we are not like other animals. Human beings are the only, are the only creatures on earth, right, that is, uh, unhappy because of many reasons, right? One of the things is that humans are, humans are very unhappy with the past because when something happened in the past that was pleasant, that was good, and we remember the past, we remember that, oh, the wonderful thing is over. So we become unhappy because the good thing is gone. So when we think about the past, about the good things in the past, we become unhappy. 
When we think about the terrible things in the past, the things that hurt us, and we remember that, and we say to ourselves, oh, that should not have happened to us, and then we become frustrated. We become unhappy because it happened to us. So whether we think about something that was pleasant or unpleasant that has happened in the past, we are still unsatisfied with the past. And when we think of the future, we begin to imagine the future, but then we become anxious because the future hasn't arrived. There is no certainty that the future will happen. So when we speak of the past, we are unhappy with what has happened. We, when we speak of the future, we are anxious and worried about what has not yet happened. And when we speak of the present moment, we have expectations. And these expectations lead to suffering. So whether we talk about the past, the future, or the present, if our mind continuously dwell in these three states of time frame, we will still become unhappy. Okay? So the way to deal with it is that when you think about the past, it is very important to learn to let go, to detach. And the way to let go is through forgiveness. Forgive yourself. If something that has happened, that has hurt you, forgive yourself, that maybe you made a silly decision, maybe you made a mistake, learn to forgive yourself. And forgive others. Forgive others who have hurt you. So when you deal with the past and you learn to forgive, something happens in your brain. Right? Your brain releases oxytocin. Because when you experience forgiveness, this experience of forgiveness is an experience of empathy with the person that you are forgiving, with the conditions that you are forgiving. And this bonding of this em empathic condition releases oxytocin. And we heard earlier, oxytocin is a good hormone. It is the hormone of empathy, love, and bonding. And it boosts your immune system. So, learning how to forgive is good for your health. A lot of people have a misunderstanding about forgiveness. They think of forgiveness over someone who has hurt them and say, why should I forgive that person? That person does not deserve to be forgiven. But you don't realize one very important thing. When you forgive somebody, who do you think is the first person to benefit from your process of forgiveness? It's yourself. The moment you learn to forgive someone, the moment you are joyful and happy that you have forgiven someone, that feeling triggers the release of oxytocin. And then you are the one who is going to benefit so a lot of people think, oh, forgiveness is something that benefits the other party, not me. Why should I forgive him? Well, you don't realize when you forgive someone, you are the first person to benefit. Then the next thing is that uh, when we look towards the future, we often get worried, worried about what could happen. Don't worry. If you have a plan for the future, if you have an aspiration of something you want in the future, look towards it with enthusiasm. Be excited about what you will want to do in the future. When I say excited, I don't mean emotionally arouse and get all excited over it. But just look forward to it. Look forward to what could be coming. Okay? Be enthusiastic about it. Because when you become enthusiastic, your brain releases two neurotransmitters, chemicals in the brain, dopamine and serotonin. Dopamine is the hormone of energetic reward anticipation. Serotonin is the hormone of attention and alertness. Dopamine actually helps you become more energized, more, you know, it makes you feel you enjoy life better. You enjoy what you are experiencing better. Serotonin makes you feel more alert, more aware of what's going on. Now you have to be, you have to realize one important thing. These two, these two neurotransmitters are very, very important. Deficiency in them can lead to very 
harmful and unpleasant outcome in your old age. Deficiency in dopamine leads to Parkinson's disease. This has been substantially investigated that a lot of people who suffer from Parkinson's disease at some point in time, they may be suffering from a deficiency of dopamine. Right? So when you begin to look forward to things, your brain releases more dopamine and that will help you reduce the risk of Parkinson's disease in your old age. Serotonin, a deficiency in serotonin leads to depression. And this, in fact, can get worse. What is the other thing that is worse than Parkinson's disease when you get old? Alzheimer. A deficiency in serotonin could lead to a high risk of Alzheimer disease. So now you realize, right? always when you're about to do something, engage in a task, whether it is a task involved with your novitiate program, whether it is a task involved with your meditation, whether it is a task involved with your daily activities at home when you return home, look forward to everything you have to do. Don't look at it and say, hi, it's another day. The more you, hi, it's another day, the higher risk you're going to suffer from Parkinson's disease in your old age. These two are the simple secret of wellness and happiness. But I'm not done. Yes, you have a question. Oh, Parkinson's is more something that is physical. Right? I, I can't exp I'm not a medical doctor, so I can't explain the actual condition. But it affects your body. You become very lethargic. You don't want to move around. Your movement is very slow. So it's a physical thing. But the mind can still be very sharp for people who suffer from Parkinson's disease. An uh, extreme example is Muhammad Ali. Muhammad Ali suffered from Parkinson's disease for many years, but his mind was very sharp. He was still able to think. Okay. Alzheimer's disease, on the other hand, affects memory and the mind. When a person experiences Alzheimer, that person cannot think clearly, cannot remember things very well. A classic example is, in fact, a former president of the United States who has since passed away, Ronald Reagan. After he retired as the president, for some reason over the years, he began to suffer from Alzheimer. It got to a point where he was very delusional. He could not even recognize his own family. He could not recognize his daughter. He could not even recognize his wife, but because she was by his side all the time, he was able to accept her. But otherwise, he could not recognize who is the daughter. Yeah. Yeah, that person could still be energetic, but that person is delusional in the sense that the person is unable to remember things, unable to think clearly, right? He can still eat and sleep, but he will not be able to remember who is the relative, what he did yesterday, what he's supposed to do next. The mind is no longer functional, no longer, pos no longer productive, so to speak. And so the two are opposite. One is the body, the other is the mind. So dopamine affects the body, Serotonin affects the attention system, right? the mind. But there's one more though. When you look at the present, it's very important to look around you with gratitude. Look at all the blessings that you have. Look at the fact that you are so blessed that you are able to attend the novitiate program. And I'm so blessed that I'm able to sit here and share with you all this. All these are blessings. If we look around us, everything that we have, that we are able to use and appreciate, it's all a blessing. What happens when we do that? When we, become to, uh, when we begin to feel grateful towards all our blessing, the brain releases endorphin. Wonderful. Endorphin is a very powerful natural painkiller. It is the hormone that heals physical and emotional pain. And it boosts immune system. A deficiency in endorphin will also lead a person to severe depression. So this is why when a person begins to experience depressed, so this is a small little hint to you. Whenever you feel depressed, any time when something happens in your life and you feel very unhappy and depressed, 
Do two things. First, find an activity that makes you feel excited. That activity that makes you feel excited about triggers the release of dopamine and, and, and serotonin. Right? And look for things that make you feel grateful towards. And when you do that, it releases endorphin. When these positive neurotransmitters are released in your brain, you will not experience so much depression after that. It will reduce the level of depressive state that you are experiencing. I'm not saying that it will completely stop your depression. It depends on how severe the depression is because sometimes depression can be so severe you may require medication. Right? What does the medication do? The medication actually helps you to dull your mind. Right? By dulling your mind, it actually reduces the feeling of depression. It's a, it's a false sense of security in a way, but it is a safety net in a way. Some medication helps to promote the release of serotonin, but it is not easy to take medication to release more serotonin. It just causes the serotonin to flow more in, in the brain, and then it makes you feel less depressed. So these are the three simple little secrets. Look back in the past with forgiveness, realizing that you are the person who is going to benefit from your forgiveness. Right? You forgive someone, that person is not going to really benefit because if he doesn't know about it, how is he going to benefit about it? But you are the first person who will benefit. Look towards the future with enthusiasm. Look around you with gratitude. So these are the simple little secret of wellness and happiness. Because if we are able to do that, when we are faced with changing vicissitudes of life, conditions that are changing, anicca, things that are disturbing us, uh, they give rise to suffering, giving rise to various forms of dukkha. If the mind can be kept undisturbed, free from worry, lust and fear, this is the supreme bliss. And this has been clearly mentioned in the Mangala Sutta, where it is basically the blessings. So learn to abandon evil ways to enter the good life and purify one's mind. This is the teaching of all the Buddhas. And it will help us to transcend beyond our present worldly conditions. I'll show you one last video. There is a story of a Brahmin who one day found the Buddha under a tree, calmly meditating. The Buddha's mind was still. He radiated such power and strength that the Brahmin was reminded of a Tusker elephant. The Brahmin asked him who he was. Imagine a lotus that had begun life underwater, the Buddha replied. But grew and rose above the surface until it stood free. So I too have transcended the world and attained the supreme enlightenment. Who are you then? The Brahmin wondered. Remember me, the Buddha said, as the one who woke up. So the Buddha is the awakened one. He has awakened from samsara. Just as the lotus born in the water, grown up in the water, rises above the water, and remains unsoiled by the water, so is the Buddha. Though born in the world, grown up in the world, rises above the world, he remains unsoiled by the world. Now, there's a book I would like to introduce to you for those who have not read it.
please pick up this book. It's on the shelves everywhere. It might not be in the counter inside the, the main uh, reception room, but look around the, the shelves, you will find this book, Return to Tranquility, written by Venerable Dr. Punaji. It's very interesting book, very useful. It has a wonderful explanations of many things, especially explanation of what is Nibbana. Right? And the, the, for me, the most enlightening chapter is the one on Nibbana. So read this book. You will learn something from it. And if you want a shortcut, just jump straight to chapter 10. Read Nibbana. Uh, any questions, please? Okay. Thank you, Brother Billy. Let's put our palms together and say sadhu three times to Brother Billy. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu.